my channel. Welcome back to another video. I'm Jesse, and you're watching. Last year in 2019, I filmed a discussion video titled Booktube Sucks at Pride. And this video was me venting my frustrations about how every year when we see these wonderful pride stacks and we get all excited about Pride Month, the books that I see people hyping and picking up and pledging to read in celebration of Pride Month pretty much just celebrate gays and lesbians and leave out literally everybody else. The LGBTQIA community is a community that houses so much diversity. It's way more than just gays and lesbians. I talked about the erasure of bisexuals, of trans folks, of asexual people, of intersex people, and I pretty much asked everybody on BookTube to just do a better job of making sure that they were reading in celebration of the gender and sexual diversity that exists in the queer community. Now in that video I promised y'all that I would put together a BTQ recommendations video, basically a book recommendations video that focuses exclusively on bisexual, trans, queer representation. It's literally my most requested video, the video that I get the most comments about, and that's what this video is going to be. Now I spent a lot of last year specifically reading BTQ books so that I could make this video here. And this is going to be part of a series. This is going to be a regular thing on my channel. I'm hoping to make a BTQ Rex video maybe once every three months, maybe even more frequently. I have some incredible books in this stack and I'm just honestly so freaking excited to bring these to y'all. Now, if, for those of you who've been following my channel for quite some time, a lot of these books are going to be repetitive for you because you'll have seen me read them throughout the year. I do have a bunch of new subscribers, so I figured this video would be really, really good for y'all who are wanting to read with more inclusivity in your pride selections. And also it probably is a good thing to have all of these books kind of in one video in one place. So the books will be listed down below. And I broke these books down into categories. So I'm gonna talk about bisexual books, trans, spectrum books, asexual books, and queer books. Now the great thing about a lot of these books is that they are intersectional. Just because a book has a bisexual main character doesn't mean it doesn't also have queer characters or trans characters in it. So I'm going to be mentioning the same books multiple times and that's okay. So without further ado, because I have a lot of books on this list, let's just get right into it. The first book that I would like to recommend is Her Royal Highness by Rachel Hawkins. I read this last year for Pride and I could not believe that this why a contemporary romance got five out of five stars from me. It is so hard for me to give any YA contemporary or especially a romance five out of five stars just because I often feel like the romances just are underdeveloped, the writing doesn't get me, and I'm not a big romance person in general, but wow, this book was the bee's freaking knees. It's all about Millie who is a really nerdy bisexual teenager who gets her heart broken by a girl that she's absolutely head over heels for, and she's like, you know what? Funk it. I'm gonna go to Scotland and study over there. Because obviously no one ever gets their heart broken in Scotland, right? Right? Yo, maybe I should go to Scotland. Who am I kidding? If I can't get a girl to date me here, I'm not gonna get one to date me halfway across the world. Moving on! And while in Scotland, she finds that her roommate is none other than Princess Flora, the actual literal princess of Scotland. Millie and Flora hate each other from the get-go. On a camping trip, the two of them ignite a romance, and the book is basically about them trying to defend their right to be together. Now, I really loved this book because of the comedy, the characters, just the way that it read. It was so lighthearted and funny. I loved that the queerness wasn't trauma.com. There wasn't any depressing people getting kicked out of their homes. It was just a book about queer joy, queer girls getting to be queer, and I, I really, really loved that. Another thing that I really loved about this book is there is representation for a, a leading male character who everybody thinks is queer but actually isn't, and I really, really loved that because the book showed representation for the ways in which men don't have to be traditionally masculine. I thought it was really awesome to see representation for a boy who just wanted to be himself. He wasn't quote unquote like the other boys and that was okay and totally valid and there's just so many little things about this book that I absolutely love. Now I would literally be cancelled and run off of booktube if I didn't mention The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I read this along with every other person in the world in 2018 and fell head 
head, head, head over heels for it. This is historical fiction that is inspired by the infamous Elizabeth Taylor who is known for having seven husbands. Now Evelyn Hugo is a Cuban woman who moves to California in order to pursue her dreams of being an actress and basically taking over the world. She's absolutely drop dead gorgeous and in order to make it in Hollywood, she passes herself off as white. And the book is basically about Evelyn Hugo when she's in her 80s and she's been incredibly secretive about her seven husbands and she summons this journalist into her mansion and says, hey, I'm going to give you and only you my story. And so the book is Evelyn Hugo telling this journalist about her seven husbands. It's amazing because we get so much information about Hollywood culture. There is a central female female romance that is absolutely my heart and soul. I absolutely love the couple in this book and the bisexual rep is fantastic. I felt like this book did an amazing job, probably the best job I think I've ever read of explaining bisexuality and why it's valid, why it's not a phase, really digging into how a person can truly be attracted to more than one gender without one attraction diminishing the other. All in all, it was an amazing book. The writing was fantastic. And I know you already know about this book because it's been everywhere, but in case you haven't, definitely read this. I would also be remiss not to mention Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. It's important to note that Casey McQuiston is a non-binary author and this is an adult contemporary romance about the son of the first female president of the United States falling in love with the Prince of Wales. Now Alex, the son of the president, is, is our main protagonist and he realizes that he is bisexual when he falls in love with Prince Henry. Now as you can see, I'm not done with the book yet. I am 75% of the way finished with it, but I have to say the bisexual rep is fantastic. And I really love seeing representation for bisexual men, especially because I hear so much rhetoric about how girls can be bi, but men can't. If men are bisexual, it means that they're secretly just in the closet and not ready to come out. And that is such biphobic bullshit. And I just love how this book handles Alex's bisexuality. I will say Alex is half Mexican and the Mexican rep in this book is absolutely trash. For those who don't know, I am Mexican and I literally can't stand the way that his heritage is treated in this book. It's literally only brought up if they're trying to make a reference to Mexican food or if they're trying to prove a point about race. Mexican identity doesn't just exist to contrast white supremacy. I just have a lot of issues with how Alex's Mexican identity is used in this book. It's not the end of the world. It's just something that irritates me. This book is super smutty and if you want some male male sex scenes, definitely pick this up. It also has just absolutely riotous banter and it's keeping me really, honestly, the character interactions and the jokes are what is carrying me through this novel. As of right now, I would probably give it like a three stars. Now moving on to our trans spectrum recommendations. For those who aren't aware of what I mean when I say trans spectrum, that means I'm including trans binary and trans non-binary individuals. If you'd like more information on the transgender spectrum, definitely check out the Instagram for NB Book Club, which is a non-binary book club that I run. We read trans spectrum books every single month and there's tons of resources to educate you on what it means to be non-binary in particular. Google is also an amazing resource as well as literally all of the books that I'm about to mention. In my opinion, the best way, the absolute best way to learn about trans identities is by reading trans stories and specifically watching trans centric movies and books and podcasts and all of that. Honestly, like Google is just probably going to confuse you. If you're trying to become more educated about what it means to be trans binary or trans non-binary, please read literally all of the books that I'm about to mention. The first book that I am going to mention is one of my favorites. I know this is gonna make my top 10 of the year list and that is The Vanished Half by Britt Bennett. The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, good Lord. Holy cow, this book was a ride and a half. This is one of those books that follows a family throughout generations and I absolutely love that trope. I love when we have a book that just slowly takes us through what these characters are doing for the rest of their lives. It's so quiet and powerful. The writing is absolutely brilliant. And basically this book is about two twins who live in a town called Mallard and everybody in Mallard is incredibly light skinned. The people in Mallard have specifically breeded themselves so that they are black but are incredibly fair. 
there. The twins Stella and Desiree decide to leave Mallard and make their own way and one day Desiree wakes up to find that her twin has vanished. The conflict for this book arises when Stella leaves Desiree and decides that she wants to cross over and become a white woman and live her life as a white woman. She ends up marrying a very wealthy man. She doesn't tell him about her history and she basically just pretends that she's white. And I loved how this book talked about how racial boundaries can be so freaking flimsy and in the eye of the beholder. We honestly think that we can tell somebody's race by looking at them and that's Race is a social construct and this book is a great example of that. I identified with this book a lot because as somebody who is Mexican but doesn't fit the stereotype of what a Mexican is supposed to look like, I know how it feels to struggle with passing or to want to pass. This was great representation for what it means to be biracial or multiracial and to struggle with your identity because of that. I'm digressing though, um, the transgender rep in this book is phenomenal. We have a romance between one of our main characters and a trans man. And when I tell you that I identified with this character so seamlessly, I truly mean it. I felt like I was looking into a mirror. I'm not a transgender man, but the things that this character said about his gender identity, the discomfort that he feels with his body, um, the discomfort that he feels with the way people perceive him in his body, was honestly just like coming home. This was amazing trans representation and I highly, highly, highly recommend it. I will give a trigger warning for violence and depiction of racism. Then we have I Wish You All the Best by Mason Deaver. This is a book by a non-binary author and it is a YA contemporary romance about Ben who is kicked out of their house when they come out to their parents. They end up moving to a new school, moving in with their sister that they haven't seen in 10 years and falling in love with Nathan. This book is a great 101 introduction to what it means to be a non-binary individual. It also has phenomenal anxiety rep and the romance between Nathan and Ben is so absolutely precious. Then we have Pet, which is by Akweke Amezi, my favorite author. Akweke Amezi is a Nigerian non-binary individual and they write books specifically that centers transgender voices. Now Pet is a YA utopian novel about a 14 year old trans girl named Jam and Jam lives in a world where evil has been eradicated. Police violence doesn't exist, racism doesn't exist, transphobia doesn't exist, but one day she stumbles into her mother's studio and accidentally brings one of her mother's paintings to life and brings a monster through the painting. And the monster tells Jam that the evil is not gone and that the monster is actually there to hunt evil that is secretly lurking in her town. This is a book that is very, very small, but packs an incredible punch. There are these incredible one-liners about systemic oppression. Honestly, this book is a great critique of the systems of oppression and the violence that exists in our world. A lot of people said that it was written a little too young and that the quotes were a little too on the nose. And I can see why people feel that way. I just have such a deep-seated love for a quick AMZ. Nobody writes about transness the way that a Mezzi does and those just weren't issues for me personally. Also, how can you not fall in love with this cover? Jam is so freaking precious. There were so many times where I wanted to cry while reading this book simply because Jam is the daughter of two Nigerian parents who love and accept her completely. And it was just so beautiful seeing a transgender character be accepted and loved by her family so deeply without question. That is the world that we're fighting for, right? We're fighting for a world where trans girls, boys, and non-binary individuals can come out and not get kicked out of their houses. They can come out and change their name and change their pronouns without their parents batting an eye. That's the world that we're fighting for. There's also so much other queerness in here. There's a polyamorous family. There's a non-binary character. It's just, it's a phenomenal book. And if you want to be hit in all the feels, you should totally read it. However, I will say it does get very heavy at the end and I don't see enough trigger warnings for sexual violence, um, child abuse. Do be mindful of that going into this book. Then we have The Deep by River Solomon, which was a NB book club pick. And wow, is this book just 
it, it's incredible. The Deep is by non-binary author River Solomon and it's about the Wajinru which are a people who are the descendants of captured Africans. They were born underwater, they reproduced under the water and have adapted to live under its circumstances. But because they come from such a place of deep-seated violence, the only way they've been able to cope is by developing incredibly small memories. And so what they do is they designate one person to hold the entire history and memories for their people and then a few times a year they converge on this person and kind of feed off of them. The downside of this is that the person who's being forced to hold the memories has to live with the ancestral trauma, the full weight of a people's history every single day of their lives. And our protagonist is a young woman named Yetu and Yetu hates being the historian for her people and so she escapes and kind of forces her people to confront their own memories. And it's a deeply, deeply symbolic book. I felt so seen while reading this book and there, there's just LGBTQ representation up the wazoo. We have characters that are non-binary who use they, them pronouns. We have characters who are queer. We have a character that is coded as ace and autistic. There's just so much representation in this book. River Solomon is also an autistic author. So if you're looking to support more aut autistic authors, I cannot speak today. What's going on? What's happening? Why am I like this? Why? Just gonna put that down. Oh my gosh. This next book though, it's like the ultimate pride read. If you wanna read a book that's just like lighthearted celebration, it's a heavy hitting YA contemporary still, but it's still wicked, wicked funny, then you cannot go another day without reading Kings, Queens, and In-Betweens by Tanya Bodeju. This is an LGBTQ centric novel by a South Asian author and it's about what is her name? Nima. That's right. I'm so excited. Can y'all tell? Like, cancel me. There's a kid doing cartwheels outside my window. Where are your parents? Children are animals. Nima is a young girl who is trying to figure out her queer identity. And through a chance encounter with a drag queen named Deirdre, she absolutely falls in love with drag and decides to become a drag performer herself. There is so much love and celebration for drag cult culture. Wow. Drag culture and queerness. And it's absolutely riotous. It's super freaking funny. I felt like I was a teenager all over again while reading this book. And there is a character that is very, very heavily coded as transgender, but as somebody who is trans and in the closet. And I thought that representation was very important and very, very necessary. I will say that I had um, Shane from Luxurious Blue read this book and he made a really, really great point about Deirdre being a magical Negro, which is absolutely true. And if you don't know what the magical Negro trope is, look it up. It absolutely does fit Deirdre to a, to a T. So that is definitely troubling representation and just be mindful of that if you do decide to pick up this book. Then we have one of my favorite books of the year and honestly this is a book that I'm begging people to read. I'm not seeing it hyped and it, oh my gosh, this book is... <sighs> Please read this book. The Antidote for Everything by Kimmery Martin. Holy cow, was I not expecting this book to be so freaking amazing. Absolutely phenomenal, five out of five stars. Would have rated it higher if I could. This is a book about the friendship between two doctors, Georgia and Jonah. Georgia is a heterosexual cisgender white woman and her best friend Jonah is a queer cis Asian man. Now Jonah gets in trouble at the clinic that they both work at for treating transgender patients. The clinic gets its funds from a very religious church and decides that they do not want to treat patients that are LGBTQIA. Jonah and Georgie are incredibly upset about this and the hospital finally just decides to get rid of Jonah for his lifestyle. So Jonah ends up getting accused of stealing drugs from the hospital and gets fired. And Georgia, being his well-intending best friend, she wants to use her cishet white girl privilege in order to help out her best friend, but she ends up making it incredibly, incredibly worse. This book is amazing because it is written by a doctor who is trying really hard to bring to light issues in her field with LGBTQIA people receiving care. The issues that are represented in this book are absolutely real. It is legal to refuse care to LGBTQ patients in various clinics in the United States and queer and trans people specifically end up dying as a result. Yesterday on my Instagram, I shared an article 
from a trans man where he talks about how he desperately needed a blood transfusion and he almost bled out and died because a nurse refused to initiate the transfusion that he needed. Does have a really great adult contemporary romance, does have really great conversations about how to be an ally and how to acknowledge your privilege, which is honestly something that I think a lot of people really are trying to do right now, which is great. But it's also about this very, very real barrier to healthcare that queer people, specifically transgender people, face every day in America. I thought that it handled race and gender and sexuality so freaking well while still being funny and lighthearted without using that comedy as a way to undercut all of the important issues that are portrayed in this book. I've had conversations with Kimmery Martin, the author, about how she did the representation and honestly I stand by it so, so heavily. This is a book that I want everybody to read. I'm like literally begging you. Then we have one of my favorite LGBTQIA books of all time. That is Patsy by Nicole Dennis Ben. June is Caribbean Heritage Month for those who aren't aware. And this is a Caribbean book by a Caribbean author who I believe is also queer. And when I tell you the queer representation in this book is amazing. It's amazing. Patsy is an adult novel about a woman named Patsy who falls in love with her best friend when they are girls. And her best friend is a very beautiful light skinned Jamaican ends up moving to New York in order to pursue her dreams. Patsy ends up getting pregnant. She doesn't want a child, but abortions aren't accepted in her town. And so she's forced to carry the child to term. And ultimately she decides to abandon her child in order to pursue the woman that she loves in New York City. So in this book, we're following Patsy and her child, True, throughout their lifespan, which y'all know is a trope that I really, really love. And this book raises so much moral questions. Um, it's a book that will really challenge your empathy. Patsy is a character that will try your patience, upset you and enrage you. And honestly, I just love the way that she was written. I thought this book was phenomenal. I thought it handled these issues so well. Patsy's child is transgender. And when I'm telling you that this is one of the best representations of being trans non-binary in the world, I truly, truly mean that. I saw so much of myself in True. And then um, I also really loved the way Patsy's queerness was handled. A lot of this book is about being older and having to come out as queer and then being like, what the hell am I doing? How do I do this? How do I participate in a community that is very, very focused on young voices? How do you be queer as an older adult who didn't get to experience being out and queer their whole life? This book is amazing. It talks about race and immigration and light skin privilege and the way that immigrants get forced to take jobs that are well, well below their qualifications in America in order to survive. It's an incredible book, but it's riddled with violence. But it is one that I would encourage you to read if you are able to and if you like morally ambiguous characters. Then we have Freshwater by Akwek Amezi, which is my favorite book of all time. Now, technically, my favorite book of all time is White Oleander by Janet Fitch. That's been my favorite book since high school. But excluding that book, because that book is just like untouchable to me. Fave. Out of every book I've read since high school, this is absolutely my favorite book. It's a book that I see myself in the way I see myself in a mirror. This is a book by my favorite author, Akweke Mezi, and it's about a young individual living in Nigeria named Ada. And their entire life, Ada has shared their body with other entities. But it isn't until Ada moves out of Nigeria to America and experiences trauma that these other entities crystallize into individual selves and Ada has to fight with these selves in order to gain control of their body. This is another book that has a lot of violence. It's a heavy read. There's a lot of content warnings, but it is so beautifully written. And if you're able to listen to audiobooks, I highly, highly recommend the audiobook. Ada is a trans individual and the transgender representation was just amazing. It is a book that is kind of hard to pin down it's one, it's a book where you'll have to really read lines over and over again and think very critically about what's happening. It's not a book where everything is just like laid out for the reader. It's one that requires a lot of dissection. So if you are in the mood for that, if you like books that are kind of challenging narrative styles, definitely read this. Like I said, it's my favorite book and you'll see why when you read it. I also want to plug their upcoming book. This comes out in August. This is The, the Death of Vivek Oji. <laughs> I'm canceled. I forgot the title. Definitely pre-order this book. It's all about trans folks living in Nigeria and it's... I can't even be articulate about how much I love this book, how deeply I love this book, because what's the fucking point? The representation for trans identities in this book goes far and beyond what I ever thought was possible 
to do with words. It's a very deep and eviscerating exploration of homophobia in Nigeria, the homophobia that we allow to exist in our own families, of gender, of culture, and of love and romance. It's also so radical in its queerness. I just, I love this book. I can't wait to reread it. And it hit me very, very hard. Then we have Homie, which is a radical collection of poems by non-binary author Donna Smith. They are also a local author, which I absolutely love that. And I've seen them perform spoken word so many times. They're absolutely incredible. It's full of black vernacular, black culture, black language, and it intersects a lot with queerness and trans identity. It's a messy poetry collection. It's riotous, it's bold, it's not pretentious. Smith says exactly what they want to say on the page without getting bogged down by excessive metaphor, but also the imagery in this collection is still so lyrical and beautiful. Then we have Space Between by Nico Tortorella. For those of you who don't know, Nico is an actor on the TV show Younger and also a drag performer. And I absolutely love Younger, which is where I fell in love with them. And then they came out as genderqueer and I was so freaking happy. This is their memoir and honestly if you're trying to understand non-binary identities you have to pick this book up. The way that Nico writes is so insightful and beautiful and I love hearing them talk about their queerness and their identity and their experiences. There are such gorgeous poetic lines in here and also lines that will make you like nod your head especially if you're a queer trans person where you'll be like yes this makes sense I see myself in these lines. Honestly everything Nico does is so inspiring and and beautiful and you cannot allow yourself to exclude this book in your education about transness or if you are trans you cannot allow yourself to not get to experience the beauty that is this book. Also like the cover. I can't. It's, it's perfect. It's a, it's a perfect cover. It's perfect. Then we have what is probably my favorite book of 2020 so far. And if you've been following me for any length of time, you already know what this book is because I've been raving about it on Twitter and Instagram since January. And that is none other than All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. As you can see, I loved this book. I just started highlighting whole paragraphs in this book. This is a memoir that is marketed towards teens by black, queer, and gender non-conforming activist George Johnson. And it's just so wild how much I connected with this memoir and how good it was. It honestly wasn't even like I was reading a nonfiction narrative. Truly, that's how much I enjoyed this book, how much I saw myself in this book, and how much I simply loved it. It's definitely a heavy read at times because it does talk about homophobia and racism and transphobia, but it also has so much black love and black joy. I felt so seen as a non-binary person and the things that George was writing about their gender completely captured the way that I felt about my own. It also talks so much about the spaces, the incredibly small closets that we stuff our boys into, how boys aren't allowed to smile or laugh or like flowers or truly get to explore who they are as people before they are forced to put on the shoes of a man. The conversation about toxic masculinity in this book is so important and so hypercritical. I want every single person in the world to read this book, especially all of my white subscribers. I need you to order this book and I need you to read this. We are reading it for NB Book Club this month, which I'm so excited to be rereading it via audio because George is the narrator. The really exciting news about this is famed actress and my future wife, Gabrielle Union. <coughs> Swallow my own spit. Gabrielle Union is turning this into a TV series. Yes. Now wrapping up our transgender fiction, I have to mention Dama by Sarah Blake. We're gonna talk more in depth about this book later on in the video. Dama questions her gender as a woman very often throughout this book. She has a lot of conversations about whether or not she really is a woman, what womanhood means. There's a level of fluidity and ambiguity surrounding her gender and her feelings on it. And we definitely need representation and depiction of people that are questioning their gender. It's people that refuse to even question their gender, people who refuse to even look at it, that are the ones who end up committing hate crimes against gender non-conforming and trans people. Even if you ultimately decide, okay, I am cisgender, it's so important to still think and sit down and focus on what your gender means to you what it is. I think there's a lot of people that are cisgender. For those who don't know, cisgender means not trans. And I think that there's a lot of people who are cisgender who have literally never taken the time to go, 
What does my gender mean? What does it mean to me personally to be a woman? Not what society says womanhood is, but what does it mean to you as an individual? Uh, what does it mean to you as an individual to be a boy or to be a man? These are questions that I really, really need my cisgender allies to start asking themselves because only in understanding your own gender and really thinking critically about it are you able to accept other people's gender. And it's people that refuse to do this work that are largely responsible for a lot of the hatred that trans spectrum people experience. Now I would like to focus on some representation for asexual identities. I've already talked to y'all about The Deep by River Solomon and one of the characters here is definitely on the spectrum it isn't laid out specifically because in this world they don't have the same language surrounding LGBTQIA identities as we do in ours, but I would say that this character is very much ace coded. Far more explicitly laid out, we have Ray Bearer by Jordan Ifueco, which is I mean, I'm not gonna lie, this might be my favorite YA fantasy of 2020. This book took me by storm and it's a debut novel. It's a West African fantasy about a young girl who has lived her whole life in this beautiful but isolated palace and she's never met another child. She's been raised by this mysterious woman known only as the lady and one day the lady charges her with moving into the kingdom and becoming one of the prince's trusted council of 11. When she secures a place on this council, she then has to kill the prince. What I loved about this book is it's so stereotypical in its synopsis, but at every single turn, it subverts your expectations for where the story is going to go. You think, okay, of course she and the prince are gonna fall in love. You make all of these assumptions based off of the synopsis, and the book turns out to be something else entirely, something way more magical and way more beautiful. And that's why I absolutely love seeing authors of color take tropes that are very traditionally white in their basis and then put their own spin on them. I love seeing BIPOC authors tell the same types of stories we've had shoved down our throats our whole lives through their lens because they bring their own creativity and culture and perspective into these classically tried out and dried out tropes and turn them into pure magic. There's only one narrative voice but a very central main character comes out as being asexual and when this character came out I wept. I wept like a English lady. It was literally God save the queen. Next we have my favorite YA horror book, which is Sawkill Girls by Claire Legrand. This is a book following three girls, each who live on Sawkill Rock, where girls have been going missing for decades. These girls say, okay, enough is enough, and then they set out to hunt this freaking monster. There is a central female-female romance that is absolutely beautiful. We have representation for a plus-size girl as well as an asexual black protagonist. When I tell you that the asexual rep hit me hard as somebody who's on the spectrum, I was so happy and giddy while reading Zoe's character. It was just so beautiful. She definitely struggles with her asexuality and with feeling less than, and I love seeing her come to a good place with it and the way that she talks about it and the way that she navigates it. It just, honestly, it was so beautiful. I have been singing this book's praises for like two years, and if you like horror, and if you like gay shit, you gotta read this book. And lastly, for the asexual portion of this video, I have to mention Let's Talk About Love by Claire Kahn. I want to say as a disclaimer that I didn't love this book. I think I gave it uh, like two and a half stars, but I didn't hate it. So there's that. And also I think that a lot of people, like a lot of people have very polarizing opinions on this book. And I just realized that I was not the target audience for this book. And so I want to make that perfectly clear. Like don't let the fact that I didn't love it deter you from potentially picking it up yourself. This is a new adult contemporary romance about a girl named Alice who is just starting college and she is bisexual and asexual. Alice just got broken up with by her girlfriend and she resolves that she's never gonna fall in love again and then she meets this very, very cute boy in a library and the book is about them navigating their friendship potentially turning into more. Now, this is the book out of all of the ace books that I've mentioned so far that focuses on asexuality and conversation about it the most in the most depth however I just didn't like how childish Alice's character was she was really really giggly and her behavior was literally like a 
10 year old girl and it just kind of weirded me out. I just didn't identify with it personally and it made her perspective kind of a dredge to get through. I also found her relationship with her best friend very troubling because her best friend is a freaking jerk and that really was never addressed throughout the story. Like her best friend is a total mean girl. But if you're kind of new to what asexuality is or if you are asexual yourself or if you're questioning whether or not you might be asexual, this is still a really good book to read. I've noticed that ace people are super, super freaking particular about the way that we're represented in stories. And so I know ace people that loved this book and I know ace people that hated the representation in this book. Feel free to read it and see where you fall on, on the spectrum. And lastly, we are going to talk about queer representation before I wrap this video up. I have to start by mentioning Patsy by Nicole Dennis Ben because Patsy herself is queer as well as Patsy's child who is trans and queer too. And I really, really loved how this book focused on queerness in families. That's something that we don't talk about often enough. I actually come from a queer family and so it was really, really nice to see representation of another queer family in this story as well. Then we have what is definitely my favorite adult science fiction novel of 2020 so far, which is Vanished Birds by Simon Jimenez. This is another book that I'm seeing zero hype for and why? 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 It is a book by a Latinx author and it has so much ethnic and sexual diversity in it. What more could you freaking want? And it's set in space and there's time travel. I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make him drink. This is also a really great book for people who are interested in science fiction, but you're not super interested in it because it's sci-fi, but it's not high sci-fi. It's not very technical. I love high science fiction. However, there are definitely times where, like right now, like I can't handle intense sci-fi, right? I don't have the mental bandwidth with everything that's going on with COVID and the protests and my own personal life to handle like, a deeply, deeply technical science fiction book. However, when I'm in a good headspace, I absolutely love them. That being said, this is a book that follows multiple characters. We have a heterosexual, dark-skinned, black main character. We have another main character who is Asian and queer. And honestly, the queer representation is amazing. I really, really liked the romance in this book, even though it's, it's rough and sad. The future building in this book is amazing, and I really, really love the world that was created. Basically, this is about a boy who crash lands onto a planet. Something is incredibly special about this boy. There's a corporation after him who wants to obtain him for their own purposes. And so one of our protagonists, Captain Nia, ends up taking this boy in and raising him so that she can one day give him to the corporation. However, Nia has a change of heart and decides to get him back at all costs. This is one of those books where the less you know, the better. But when I tell you that it's tragic and heartbreaking and so sad and it's a trigger warning for violence and so creative, it's so freaking good. If you're into sadism, like you want a book to make you hurt, like you want a book to make you feel like you just got chained to a bedpost and whipped, but make it gay, now I have to mention another one of my favorite books of 2020, which is The Collected Schizophrenias by Esme Wong. This is a memoir from queer author Esme Wong who lives with schizophrenia. It's told in essay format and she's basically just walking you through her experiences, her thoughts, her cultural criticisms, her social criticisms, everything. Between this and All Boys Aren't Blue, these are the two books that, that I see myself in the most out of everything that I've read in 2020. As somebody who does live with mental illness, I found so many parallels to the things that I've experienced and felt and struggled with to Esme's experience. Look at how heavily I tabbed this book. There were lines in this book that I felt were taken from my own diary. Queer folks get left out of the conversation on mental health too often and I really just can't beg you enough to read this book. Now I would be canned to the sold if I didn't mention the Broken Earth trilogy in this queer portion of the video. I literally felt like N.K. Jemisin was just like, how queer can I make this book series? This is a series that I've raved about a thousand times on this channel. So so I'm not, I'm not even going to. I, all I'm gonna say is it's an adult dystopian fantasy where the cast is black. It's amazing. It's amazing. I have tabbed it to all hell. It's just absolutely incredible. You have a trans woman character. You have a female female romance. You have polyamorous characters. You have a queer male main character. It's just, it's, it's amazing. This book is all about the diversity that exists among black people. And you can't talk about the diversity that we have inside of us as black people without talking about queer and transgender black people. And N.K. Jemisin did 
a bang up job of highlighting that in this trilogy. I also want to talk about Hunger by Roxane Gay, which is another amazing memoir from a queer author. Cultural critic and essayist and author Roxane Gay experienced extreme sexual violence as a kid and it's basically the memoir of her body, the body that she lives in being a plus sized woman in America. This is a book that made me cry. This is a book that made me feel seen. She writes about queerness in a way that is so absolutely phenomenal. It's one of those memoirs that I really want everybody to read, especially people that have some fat phobia that they need to work through, especially people that think they know a lot about fat people's bodies or have a lot of opinions about fat people's bodies that they probably shouldn't have. Honestly, it's just an incredible book and I really, really want everybody to read it. I have to mention Nama again because this book is queer start to finish. This is the retelling of Noah and the Ark through the perspective of Noah's wife, Nama, who is a very queer woman and she has she has a lot of sex in this book. If you want biblical book but make it queer, then here you go. Honestly though, it's like hallucinatory and poetic and lyrical and I just can't wait for Sarah Blake's next book. I also want to mention Kings, Queens, and Inbetweens again because this book is queer start to finish. So many queer characters throughout the cast and conversations about queerness and then this is also another great book that features queerness in families. And the last book that I'm going to mention in this video is In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado, which was my favorite book of 2019. This is another queer memoir. Honestly, queer memoirs are crushing it. And it uses the metaphor of the haunted house in order to explore abuse in queer relationships. As somebody who loves horror, as somebody who loves ghouls and things that go bump in the night, this book meant the world to me. And the reason that I love horror so much, I've talked about this in the past, is because horror is an amazing way to explore the horrors that we keep inside of ourselves. And this book did an amazing job of that. Honestly, it's so good, but obviously trigger warning for partner abuse. So that is going to do it for this video. This will not be the last BTQ recommendations that I do on this channel. You will see so, so much more of these videos. If you stayed until the end of this incredibly long video, thank you so much. And let me know in a comment down below with the word unity, because this book is all about unifying the queer community. Did I just say book? This video. I need to stop filming. I do want to wrap this video up by talking about the two black transgender women who were killed this week, as well as Iana Dior, a black transgender woman who was beaten by a mob of 15 to 30 men. Transgender women are the most likely women to be murdered in the United States, and you can double that if the woman is black. Tony McDade is a black trans man who was killed by police earlier this month. Trans lives are under siege, and this is why the comments that JK Rowling made on her Twitter about trans women not being real women cannot be allowed to continue. You need to speak up against transphobia whenever you see it, whenever you hear it, no matter how small or innocent it might sound. There's a direct line between innocent and small transphobic comments to mobs that beat up transgender women. People across the trans spectrum are in danger and you cannot celebrate pride. You cannot have LGBTQIA pride while excluding trans voices. If you liked this video, please give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I would absolutely love it if you became a part of my bookish family. All of my social media links are in the description box below. Stay safe and I can't wait to see you in my next video.